Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. But who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And who is he? Bruce Rivers, he's the criminal lawyer. And what he do? And he's gonna react to all the self snitching. Oh. Hi, this is Bruce Rivers. Welcome to another episode of Criminal Lawyer Reacts, CLR Bruce Rivers. I am that guy. Bruce Rivers, I am board certified criminal defense lawyer, which means I go and try cases. I don't just sit there and hold your hand while you plead guilty. Today we're going to react to a new banger from JCS. I haven't seen it. I have no idea what it's even about, but you guys will love it because we all love JCS, don't we? But before we get to that, guess what? Guess what? This is brought to you by eForms.com. eForms.com. You're starting out the new year. You, let's say you're going to sell your motorcycle to your great-grandmother who's on her deathbed and you've conned her into paying a shit ton of money for it. You don't want it to come back and bite you. So you get a bill of sale. You have her sign an agreement. Where do you get that? You get that on eForms.com. Doesn't matter what state you're in. Power of attorney, eviction, or a bill of sale. Anything you need. eForms.com has got you covered. Don't hire a guy like me because well, guess what I do? I would just go to eForms.com and... You know, you'd have to pay a ton of money to me, and I would just cut that out. So go to eforms.com. They got you covered. Let's just get right into this because I have no idea what this is even about. This is uh, our content genius, Michael Rivers' suggestion. So this is just probably some guilty pleasure reacting to crime, okay? All right, starting off, you can see this is uh, an interrogation room. You can tell by number one. Oh, wait, my ride's here. Just kidding. Um, you can tell by the cinder block, by the look on the guy's face, because he's in custody. And, um, and one of the things cops do, actually, is they'll let you sit in a room by yourself for a long time. And they'll uh, record you. And that really is a listening and response. Let's talk about Miranda for one second. When There's two things that have to happen with Miranda, to invoke Miranda. One, you have to be in custody and there's got to be interrogation. And they, and they have to be a deliberately a listening and response. Alright, alright. Right. You just say you did want water, didn't you? Oh, it's okay. You just say you wanted water, didn't you? Oh, how about if I get you a burger? How about if in nice cop, bad cop? And keep in mind, they're never a good cop. I mean, they're always out to get the you inculpate you, which means try to find you guilty. That's my card. I know I introduced myself to you at your house, but my name is Lisa Reeves, okay, and I am a detective here at the Charlottesville Police Department. Okay. So before I can, I want to talk to you. I want to make sure you do understand your rights, okay? Want well, make sure you understand your rights. This is it. now she's doing Miranda. She has to do Miranda because it's in custody interrogation. I can explain to you what's going on and all that good stuff. You understand? Uh, you understand yes. that? Okay. Today's date is. May the 3rd, 2010. The current time is... All right, your first name is George. Yes. G-E-4-1. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I did it. There's no way I can do it. No way. All right. We have no idea what this is even about yet, and we're an hour into the interview. Remember what we say here, what's our motto here? This is our motto here. You could end this interview a long time ago if you said, I want to talk to my lawyer, or I'm not going to talk to you without my lawyer present. You want to talk to a lawyer? Yeah, I want to talk to a lawyer. They have to stop questioning immediately. And now he's in handcuffs. So somewhere between then and now, he's now in handcuffs, meaning he probably was getting a little blood drain. Why did you guys say, why did you guys come in and say you were searching for an assault? I never said anything about an assault. Someone came, said, someone came in this morning. I never mentioned to you anything, just told you we're investigating someone. Investigating an assault. Do you want me to call anybody for you, George? It's an interesting concept to think of how you might respond to what would normally be an easy question, especially during a circumstance where it becomes a terrifying dilemma. We ask that you contemplate this question while you put yourself in George's position, but not before you grasp the context of what brought him to this moment. It begins with 22-year-old sports scholar Yardley Love, 
a star lacrosse player at the University of Virginia. She is captured in this photograph playing in the second to last game of the season, clearly aware of the obstacles that lie in front of her, yet continuing to move forward, which is the circumstantial detail that turned this picture into a symbol for the globally recognized organization that would be founded in her memory. This would be the last photograph taken that day, capturing Yardley's last embrace with her head coach Julie Myers. Both were unaware this exact moment would soon be on the national front pages. On May 3, 2010, at roughly 2.15 a.m., Yardley's roommate returned from a night out to their off-campus apartment. Upon entering, she saw that Yardley's bedroom had been broken into, at which point she rushed inside to find her unresponsive on the mattress. She had blood coming out of her nose and severe bruising across the right side of her face. But the most alarming thing was that she wasn't waking up. Her friend called 911, who instantly guided her through the steps of CPR, which was then taken over by paramedics who arrived on the scene four minutes later. But their attempts at revival... So, let's just talk about self-snitching for one second. When you sit down with the cops, you have no idea what they know and what they don't know. Even if you are innocent, and I don't know if this guy's innocent or not. My guess is because of JCS is doing a video on it, he's probably not. And let's give some love to JCS. He does a really good job. But when you are in that hot seat, and you could unwittingly corroborate some facts of the case that put a, a nail in your coffin, even if you're innocent. So that's why we don't want to give an interview. Unsuccessful, and Yardley was pronounced dead at exactly 2.47 a.m. At 2.53 that same morning, criminal investigator Lisa Reeves woke up to a phone call from the sheriff's office. By 2.59, she had arrived at Yardley's apartment leading the investigation, and by 3.50, confirmed that she had her first person of interest, which was 22-year-old George Hughley V, Yardley's ex-boyfriend, and the next several hours were spent gathering information before she knocked at his front door. She found out that George was a fifth-generation heir to a very wealthy American family, whose roots lay in lumber dating back to the 1900s. He was educated at Landon Prep, a prestigious all-boys private school in Bethesda, Maryland, with annual tuition fees of up to $50,000. George was the star player of the lacrosse team and became an all-American athlete. This led to a full scholarship at the University of Virginia, where he remained a key player in the starting lineup, and where he would also meet, then spark a romance with fellow lacrosse player Yardley love they dated for almost two years so the boyfriend or the close associate or husband or fiance or whatever is always going to be the first person that they look at somebody close somebody the closest and that would be the person that they're now looking at right love's relationship was an on again off again one where they cheated on each other throughout and that tempers flared both ways what was going on with these two young people what may have led someone to do what happened these are just a completely unbelievable set of facts everybody watched the relationship people were really troubled by it they were scared for her and nobody knew what to do Yardley ended the relationship in 2010, just two weeks before graduation. Nine days later, she was found dead in her bedroom. And that same morning, George Hughley would hear a knock at his front door. He opened to Detective Lisa Reeves, who was dressed in civilian clothing. She introduced herself as a police officer, but mentioned nothing of the crime. She simply stated that she was conducting an investigation that could benefit from his presence at the sheriff's office. George's response was to lethargically put on his flip-flops, then walk over to the passenger side door of her unmarked police car and let himself in. Somewhat bewildered, Lisa got in and drove them to the police station a few minutes away without talking. It was around then when she noticed bruising on his knuckles and cuts on his forearm, at which point George was no longer a person of interest. He was the prime suspect. So bruising on your knuckles, cuts on his forearm. When you have physical injuries that could be innocently described, you know, caused from something else, this is a circumstantial case because there's no eyewitness, right? So they take little bits here, little bits here, little bits there, and that's how they build a case, especially a circumstantial case. And you know the difference between circumstantial and direct evidence. Direct evidence is I saw him stab her. Circumstantial evidence is you see tracks in the snow where you can see somebody had walked. So you can infer from that circumstance that somebody had walked in the snow. All right. You just say you did want water, didn't you? I know I introduced myself to you at your house, but my name is Lisa Reeves. Today's date is May the 3rd, 2010. The current time is... I can't 
on that. 752, right? My draw the papers too. Yeah. What's that? My draw the papers too, right now. Yeah. All right, your first name is George? Yes. Right away, you'll come to notice that George is oblivious to the gravity of his situation, and it would be very safe to assume that he at this moment is unaware that Yardley has died. He seems to believe that he's in as much trouble as he would be sitting in a principal's office, perhaps for getting in a fight at class or on the lacrosse field. Let me tell you something about people who are fifth generation wealth or whatever, a lot of times they are, are entitled and don't think anything bad's ever gonna happen to them. And if he thinks he just beat her up and she passed out, um, not knowing she's dead. That could explain why he is the way he is. The sooner he provides a sanitized version of the truth, the sooner he'll get to go home. This, of course, ties in perfectly with the interrogator's opening strategy, which we've labeled warmth for the sake of this video. She will downplay the severity of his situation to a considerable degree while maintaining a friendly temperament with a sympathetic undertone. She needs the suspect to feel safe and secure for the time being. As and it's not illegal for the cops to lie to you, okay? So that's, they do that all the time. They try to create an atmosphere of uh, cooperation, and we're not here to really fuck your program up. You know, we just want to get to the bottom of what happened, and, and you'll just help us do that. As cautious he is, the more information he's likely to give away. Then as soon as he locks himself into one particular storyline, the pressure can commence, which often leads to a suspect being laden with panic and contradictions. Before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before questioning and have one present during questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. And if you're willing to talk to us now, you have the right to stop talking any time. George has two options here. Option one is to remain silent, then allow his father to get him the most expensive attorneys in the country. He would then have years to examine the evidence, evaluate the many options available, and then construct the most self-preserving storyline with world-renowned experts in criminal defense before they present it to a jury. Unfortunately for George, he takes option two. But before he does, re-watch the flawlessly reassuring manner in which he's given the final piece of the Miranda warning. <laughs> And if you're willing to talk to us now, you have the right to stop talking any time. Got it? Yep. Awesome. Just need your signature there, that you understand your rights. This is a critical, critical, critical stage. And I can't tell you how many cases I could have won, but for my client's mouth. Whether you're guilty or not, the advice still holds because you don't know what you're going to say to eventually trigger something that will corroborate some other fact in the case that hangs you. Willing to talk to us? And the time now is 7.53. All right. Let's kind of start. I'm going to kind of ask you some questions, and like I said, we'll explain things a little bit later. Um, tell me about your day yesterday. Played golf with um, our parents as a, a, a father-son. Uh, good event. I went to dinner with my dad and my two buddies, and then... Uh, Went home, went to the bar for like a little while. Um, then I went over to talk to Yardley and... He just places himself at the scene. They didn't have any of this information prior to him going there, or maybe they did have some, but he just made himself the last one to see her alive, essentially. Who's Yardley? Yardley well, is my former girlfriend. Okay. Which this whole thing's about, which I understand, but... George has now initiated the investigative subject matter himself. It's the perfect opening scenario for the interrogator because she's given nothing away. Ma right now, I know this is about Yardley. So you, you see, he just he just screwed himself. He just absolutely screwed himself because he is now last person to see her and he knows what this is about. It's more likely for him to reveal details that will contradict the evidence. When I went over to talk to Yardley, I. I like was like Yardley, and she was like already f like totally freaked out because because of what she did this past like a few days ago, and she we haven't talked since. And I was just gonna go talk to her. Mm -hmm. Yardley slept with another lacrosse, and I was just gonna go talk to her. I was just going to go talk to her, but instead I beat the fuck out of her. That's essentially what he's trying to say. Player from North Carolina the week before, which is what he just referred to. And she was already like, oh, like freaking out. Like, you know, you can't go to the camera. And I was like, 
you know, he's just trying to talk to you. The investigation team obviously had no way of knowing this, and George has now confessed to the crime of second-degree trespass. More importantly, however, he's just confessed to initiating the supposed confrontation. He now can't say that he was somehow tricked or misled into that situation. He knowingly stepped into it, and the critical fact he can actually recognize and remember this will be used against him repeatedly in the future. And, like, she, like, started being, like, like getting, like, all, like, you know, like, really, like, defensive. She was already, like, on the defensive edge. And, like, I was like, listen, I'm not here to, like, I'm just here to talk to you. And she, like, got all, like, like, sat up. Like, her bed's against the wall, like, if it was in this corner. She was, like, up against the wall. And I was like, like, we were sitting there talking. And, like, she started being, like, like, you know, like, getting, like, all, like, aggressive after this and so i was like all right like chill out like and shook her a little bit so just to recount what george said over so he admits to shaking her so i just shook her a little bit because you know because every good girl needs a little shaking once in a while i mean guys let me just tell you something don't ever put your fucking hands on a woman even if she's putting her hands on you guess what who goes to jail you go to jail every time not a, it's just never worth it. If it gets to that point, turn around, walk the fuck away. But he should never even been in there in the first place. Guess what? This is fueled by what? Alcohol. It's fueled by uh, betrayal. It's fueled by a bunch of bullshit. And it made no sense for him to go there after drinking. If he he should have just texted her and and said all these nasty shit in a text. Guess what? If he said this nasty shit in a text, I'm not saying he should say that, but if he did that, guess she'd still be alive and he wouldn't be on the fucking hook for murder. Last 47 seconds. Yardley was defend. Although this was 2010, I don't think people texted much in 2010. While being in a defensive state, she backed up against the wall. She then became aggressive. George's response to this supposed aggression was to initiate physical contact. And she started being like, like freaking out. And I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything. I'm here to talk to you about everything that's in suit. I'm here to talk to you. Talk to you totally. And she was like, and like, sort of like, being like, no, 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 like, like hitting her head, like, st like stop. Like, like, she's in the corner, I was the bed. I was like, stop. Like, I was like, we were like, what the hell? Like, we were just going to talk. So let's go back half a minute and dissect what actually just happened there. And so I was like, all right, like, chill out, like, and shook her a little bit. He will now say the words, and she started being like, then simultaneously mimic a body colliding with the wall. He will then stop himself mid-thought and subtly modify the detail. And she started being like, like, freaking out. And I was like, listen. And she started being like, like, freaking out. He goes from illustrating Yardley hitting the wall to, as he states, freaking out. Now keep in mind, when you go to trial, a prosecutor is going to play this statement. And he, they're going to cover this word by word by word, action by action by action. They're going to pick every little tiny thing apart. And guess what you get to do when you're a defense lawyer and your client is sitting there? You get to fucking take it. That's all you can do. He seems to realize mid-sentence, this isn't the best way to explain her injuries. So he changes the detail to buy himself time. And she started being like, like freaking out. And I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything. I'm here to talk to you. He carefully shifts the topic from Yardley to himself and keeps it there for eight seconds before attempting to re-explain what occurred in a more self-preserving manner. And she was like, and like, sort of like, being like, no, 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 like, like hitting her head, like. No jury on the planet will believe that Yardley was voluntarily slamming her head against the wall with enough force to cause fatal brain damage. All George has done here is give away the fact that he knows Yardley has sustained some type of head injury and now lied on record about how it was inflicted. See, all these little details would not be present for the cops to use if he didn't give a statement. Now, does that mean that I advocate domestic violence or that I advocate getting domestic abusers off? No, but as a criminal defense lawyer, that's what I do. And so it just kills me when you take away an argument that I could have made or, you know, on, on the evidence, but you, get, you give it away. 
and in a way, it makes our job a little bit easier in, in some respects because if they, if they commit, if they admit to the crime. But here's the here's the juxtaposition on that, is that if he gives a statement that's inconsistent with with the physical evidence, you can't really have them testify, or you have to have them testify, and you're gonna get fucked either way. We were already like, what the hell? Like we were just gonna talk, and like it was not at all like. I mean, could- and he keeps saying, we were just going to talk. We're just going to talk, you know, talk, me and my, just going to, I we're not here to do anything. Why would he have to say that? Why the fuck would he have to say that? You know why? Because he's probably beat her before. That is my guess. And he has to convince, I mean, there's part of what he's saying is probably true. That he, I just want to talk to you. And, and, and so by telling her, I'm just here to talk. He has to convince her of that because he's probably put his hands on her before. Conversation because that's like she was already like freaking out with just even seeing me, just even seeing me there. Okay. What happened next? What happened next? And she was. Just so she, notice, notice the the investigator actually is just calm. And it's just, what happened next? You tell the story. You dig your own grave. Hitting her head against the, against the wall while she was sitting on the bed. And I was like, I grabbed her and I like shook her. I was like, stop. Like, we need to, like, and looked at her. I was like, we need to, like, talk about this. And, like, I mean, I was on holding her arms and stuff. But, like, I, I never struck her. I never, like, hit her, hit her, like, in the face or anything. I was just like. I never, I never hit her. I never hit her. She just wouldn't listen. You know, I mean. He's giving them just like how he did it, and he's using his left hand. He talking. She was so like, she was so like, oh, I mean, what's the word? Like you know, like like flop, a fish out of the water. Like like so like all this, and I was like, listen, like I'm not here to like fight with you or like do anything. Like I'm here to talk to you, and like. And she's like, no, 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 like, get away from me. You have to leave. You have to- no, no, get away from me. Get- okay, he's got to convince himself to get, get get him in there, get himself into the apartment to begin with. He has to convince her that he's not doing anything. And then he tells the cop, get away from me. I mean, what the fuck? You, you have to leave, you have to leave, you have to leave. Like, oh. She tells him to leave. I mean, these are details they didn't have. I was like, all right, like, fine, like, but like, I want to talk to you after all this. And, and like, I was, I was like a little bit persistent because of the situation, you know, my former girlfriend who, who like something happened last week, you know, and I was. Something happened last week. What else does he give him? What else does he give him? Motive, you know? I mean, she's sleeping with another guy. And so now you got, she doesn't want anything to do with you. You're pissed off and you won't fucking leave. And then she's somehow hurting herself because she's really so upset with what she did. I don't think so. Guard, like, well, so we were like talking over there, and I mean, I, somehow we ended up, somehow I was resting her on the floor, and I was just like, stop. I just, like, and I was holding her. I was holding her. I was a little bit persistent. I was wrestling her on the floor. All further evidence that designates George as the aggressor. He's completely shut down his ability to argue any sort of self-defense claim. Well, that's a good point about self-defense because self-defense is only available if you have no other option. And, and, and your actions have to be reasonable. And in most states, if you're not in your own home, you have a duty to retreat unless you're in a stand your ground state. But you can't be the initial aggressor period but as jcs is you know going through parsing out everything he's saying guess what a prosecutor does 10 times worse and if your client testifies every little word every little word gets shoved up your client's ass and then the conversation i could tell was just like it was not going anywhere and nothing was happening then fucking leave leave and let her live Putting your hands on a woman is not a fucking good idea, gentlemen. Period. And uh, she like went back to bed, and I and I laughed, and I went back home. Okay. 
Phase one is now complete. The suspect has unknowingly locked himself into a storyline that will put him away for a very long time. The risk of him shutting down or requesting a lawyer is no longer a primary concern. So the interrogator will now increase the pressure. She will confront him on certain elements that she pretended to overlook before. And the ideal scenario is to cause just enough panic so that he backpedals on previous statements and contradicts himself. So him contradicting himself is kind of important because if he ever is going to testify later, he's got to seem not credible, according to the prosecutor and the cops. So you go over there, knock on the door. Her front door is open. Her room door was closed. I knock like, like you know, are they like she heard me no, open the door and and went in. All right, went in where? To her room. All right, straight to her bedroom. Straight to her bedroom. Yeah, I mean. How'd you get through the door? Her door. Or the mm -hmm. Front door. Her door. Actually, it might have been locked. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Just, just be honest with you. Yeah, no, yeah, it was actually it was locked, yeah. Because yeah. I think I put a hole. Yeah. You punched door. a hole through the door. So, okay. Now we got a new detail that he didn't disclose earlier. And think about this. You punch a hole in the fucking door. That tells me who who is that tell you is out of control? Tells you that he's out of control. Sure, actually now. Yeah, that you said that, yeah. Right. Why'd sure. what, what, you do that? Well, well I, I you, guess, yeah, when I, once I was in her room, she was, like, very, like, you know, like, or, like, blah, 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 not, like, I don't want to talk to you, like, all this stuff. And she was very, like, you know, very on edge, like. Gee, you think you'd be on edge when somebody just broke your fucking door down? I mean, I've never had anybody break into my goddamn door. I mean, you know what? If you have to break your door down to talk to somebody... Guess what? They don't want to fucking talk to you. And if they don't want to talk to you, guess what? You walk away. You don't sit there and do this shit. You, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Representing wife beaters or girlfriend beaters or women beaters is the fucking worst thing on the fucking planet, honestly. You know, I hate them because, number one, they almost never fucking pay you uh, what, your, what your fee is. Oh, we'll give you, you know, whatever. Second of all, nothing is ever their fault. It's always her fault. And third of all, they're just fucking ugly pains in the asses. This is what I'm talking about. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. Like, uh, you know. Then don't fucking talk to her. Jesus Christ, respect a woman's autonomy and agency. Okay. I was like, listen, like, you, what you pulled last week was outrageous. Like, I just want to talk to you. What you pulled last week was outrageous. You fucked another guy on the lacrosse team and that made me look bad so that's outrageous a very unusual time to interrupt a suspect in such a contentious manner he was giving away self-incriminating information that could be used to establish a motive he was doing exactly what the lead investigator wanted but detective ed has now stopped him in his tracks it's a reckless maneuver at this point in the interrogation which detective reeves is no doubt conveying at this moment through nonverbal communication she now has to let the suspect respond as to not undermine their position because i want to talk to her Detective Reeves will now bring his guard back down through a reassuring tone and gently guide his train of thought back to his grievances with the victim. She pulls this off in three questions. All right, we'll continue on. That's fine, continue on. So you're, you're talking to her and she doesn't want to talk to you? Not really. I mean, we I mean, talked though. Like, there was parts where we were talking and then like... Do you know what you're talking about? I mean, about so many different things. Okay. Like what? Like, like what she did last week. Mm -hmm. He keeps fo focusing on what she did last week. Um, and what she did last week was uh, she screwed another guy. So the fuck what? I mean, you guys aren't even together. Like went to like, Carolina. She went to Carolina and hooked up with someone Sunday when we were still trying to figure out things. And I was over there like, like to talk, like, I was like, this is like, this is outrageous. What's more outrageous? sleeping with somebody or killing somebody because they sleep, slept with somebody what's more outrageous give me a fucking break because I was trying to make everything better and by putting bruises and multiple contusions and a brain injury into her head 
And then, like... And busting down her fucking door is making things better? Come on. No. She was very defensive because she knew, like, how upset I was because I've told her, like, through emails, like, how upset I was, like, about what... Oh, my God. <laughs> Could it get any worse for this guy? Number one, okay, so I was really upset. I mean, you have no idea how upset I was. I sent her an email how upset I was. And, uh, you know, I busted down her door. She didn't want to talk to me. Kept telling me to leave. This really is described. And plus, he's after the bar. So this is a guy out of control. He did. And so I was like, and I sat on the edge of it. I was like, listen, like, I want to talk to you. Like, like what you did was bullshit. Like, that was, that's not, like, okay. And I was just like, I, like, and, and she's like, oh, like, not, like, like, you know, she's like. She's like, not response because I guess I hit her too hard. I mean, give me a fucking break. Like, you know, sort of pushing everything that she did to the back burner and, like, talking about, like, like you know, like, like trying to, like, put everything that she did, like, wasn't important. It kept going to the point where she... See, here's the other thing about these guys who are fucking abusers. They are so self-absorbed. They're the victim in every scenario. Every scenario. Oh, you're fucking me over. Wee, 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 wee. That's what he's talking about here. You know, poor me, poor me, poor me. Guess what? She cheated on you, or didn't you weren't even together, but she did that because she was getting something from someplace else you weren't giving her. Like, I was like, listen, like, Jordan, like we have to figure like out what's going on. It sounds and like she, she had like, to figure it out. I'm not, talk, I'm not talking to you, and she like, push me, like, get out of here. Like, like go. And I was Every ounce of what he says negates any any claim of self-defense. You know, oh, Your Honor, she was hurting my hand with her face. I mean, give me a fucking break. He's got no claim of self-defense here whatsoever. And he's got no claim that I wasn't there. He's got no claim that I didn't do this. What he does have a claim is maybe it was heat of passion. Maybe. But it's got to be under circumstances that would cause an ordinary person to act in a similar way. And... It's just a, it, catching your wife in bed with another man and you shoot the other guy, that can be like heat of passion. But, or something similar, you know, where it just arouses you. To, so you kind of go ape shit for no reason. Well, for, for a reason, but, but this is not it. Be like, we have to talk. Like, like get like. When you, when and he's like, he's showing her how he's fucking shaking the shit out of her because she doesn't want to talk. Come on, man. Matt, what, what are you holding on her? On her arms. On her arms, like maybe up here? Like shoulders, yeah. Shoulders. Like, 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 come, like, like, come on, like, you know, and see, that's when she would like wiggle and like, get away and like. That looks like she's having a seizure. And it, from probably getting struck in the fucking head, because that's what'll happen if you get struck in the head like that, you'll have a seizure. It would aggress, like, defensively almost. And. She's acting defensively. I mean, this guy couldn't make it any fucking worse for himself. You know, and that's why I love these guys who are overprivileged and, you know, they have too much money and they just think they're going to talk their way out of anything. And then, I was, and then she ended up, I think she was back in bed and I, and I left and I was like, oh, this is not going to How'd she get back in bed? Uh, we were like wrestling and... We stood up and I, I tossed her, I pushed her on the bed. I was like, go to bed, like, I'll talk to you later. Did you touch her neck area at all? Did you choke her at one point? Um, I may have grabbed her a little bit by the neck. I may have grabbed her a little bit on the neck. I did everything except for kill her. Give me a fucking break. What a dumb shit. I mean, what an honest dumb shit. I mean, I just can't believe how stupid some people are. We were like, but I never, like, strangled her. Okay. Um, okay. but I... I put my hands around her neck, but I never did done strangle her. Give me a fucking break. Not, none of this. You, you can't do anything with this. You know, you get an interview like this, especially when the, when the cops really is not saying much at all. The cops are just letting him go, free form. I mean, during the whole like commotion, you know, like I we may have I might have grabbed her neck, but I never was never was like strangling her. Okay.
More detail that was unknown to the investigation. The fact that he grabbed her neck can now be used as evidence. It paints a more frightening picture of the incident with relation to the suspect's aggression toward the victim. It this sure was does. an extremely damaging revelation for George's defense. The discussion moves to the moment he left, and George admits that he took Yardley's laptop. Why'd you grab her laptop? Because I was so pissed that she wouldn't talk to me. I was like... I was so pissed. You know... I don't know how much they had without his statement, but with his statement, every single little part about what they need to prove has been sealed. And you can't just use somebody's statement alone. It's called corpus delecti. You can't eat your own body. In other words, you, if all they have is your statement, but they don't have anything corroborating it, then you then that's not enough to convict somebody. However, they have the physical evidence, and he just corroborates everything. I don't know. I don't like, took it almost as like collateral, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's... I took it as collateral? What the fuck does that mean? Collateral for what? Did you borrow her some money? Or loan her some money? I mean, give me a break. Not reasonable logic, but... Right. Okay. I don't know. Did you take anything else besides no, the laptop? No, no. Nothing? No. Okay. I mean... All right. So when, uh, when you left out of there, I mean, you saw that she was bleeding on her nose. She's now about to ask a question with the same implication for a second time. Notice what occurred the first time. Did you go back and check on her at any point? No, I did not. Okay. Did, mm. did you try to call rescue or anything to make sure she's all right? No, I did not. No. Why? I thought she was sleeping. The face of bewilderment, if there ever was one. It's very strange that he's so taken aback by such a question, especially when you take into account the possible outcome if he had actually called for help. One medical expert revealed in the courtroom for the very first time that following Yardley Love's brutal beating, had George Hughley or anyone else called for help, she might have survived. Now, that is counterintuitive in a sense, because when you commit a crime, you know, even if he thinks he's just committed a physical assault against another person, if you, you can mitigate your damages by calling for help. It's called rendering aid. And, and actually, failure to render aid can be a, an enhanceable factor in sentencing. But think about it. If he would have just said, oh, shit, I screwed up. I, I really assaulted her. She's unconscious. I, be, I better get some help for her. But instead, he's only worried about his own sorry ass. And that's what these narcissistic bastards do. Uh, I didn't think it was like, in, I didn't think that she was like in need of like going to the emergency room. I, she just got, I made a play. Why do you think that? I don't know. I mean, I, I did, did you say when you were, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you were shaking her, her head was hitting the wall? Well, that was in the beginning. That was initially when I walked in. Like she was like up in the corner, like said, "Get, like get out of here," like you know, like this. Mm -hmm. like, at, at any time when you were shaking her, did her head bang the, the wall? Put yourself in George's position and imagine Yardley had in fact self-inflicted her injuries. You would perhaps say something along the lines of, "Absolutely not." I wasn't hitting her against the wall, but like when she's uh, like sitting there in the corner. Mm -hmm. I was like, if it were like, or like, like this, and I'm like, or be like, you know, and I, I was like, 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 what the fuck was that about? Like, that, that's such bullshit that you like do that. Like, it's such a. He keeps going back over and over again how he got fucked over, how she screwed some other guy, how he is the victim. Like bullshit move, like would, would, would like you know, like everyone like, like, what are you like doing, like like that, like. Okay. She she has a pretty good knot on her head. That's why I'm asking how uh, that how how you can explain how that would have happened. I mean, I don't even know when that a knot. Mm -hmm. I mean, like on on the side of her head, she's been hit pretty good right there. So I'm just trying to figure out: Did you hit her with something? No. Was that no, her I never, head? I the never wall? never touched her, or struck her, or anything. Well, you touched her. You had your hands on. No, I, yeah, no. I, I said never struck her. Okay. So you, you I mean, I'm, I'm gonna go through this one more time, make sure we're on the same page. So you're you're pretty pissed at her from a week ago for sending you text messages. Do you have those text messages? Where she says she, uh, as you put it, fucked somebody? I actually might have those, yeah. All right, you got your phone with you? Yeah. Okay, let's, let's pull it out and scroll through it. Let's see if we can see those. 
The next moment is fascinating because it symbolizes how drastically George's life is about to change. The interrogator will invade his personal space to make sure he's not deleting anything from his phone. Soon after that, she will take the phone out of his hand and place it on the table. Actions that would be completely unacceptable in almost any other circumstance. Say. There were there were like I guess what you call like a like a an ongoing conversation, an ongoing like it's a message and it's gone. Okay. I'll leave that one. I don't leave that right in front of you. Alright. Let's talk about how you, you entered. Entered, yeah. Yeah, I mean because to put your to have put your fist the door. No, I, it's she actually my leg. I'm pretty your sure. Your leg? Because that's why my legs leak fast. Yeah, you're right. How was your leg? Yeah. How'd you get all the bruising on your hand then? This is all from the cross. This is all. That's this pretty is... fresh, right? And don't you wear gloves on the cross? Kind of like hockey gloves a little bit? Gloves. This is all from my lacrosse game on Saturday. I mean, I wear my arm, you can see where my arm pads are. Mm -hmm. Right here, my gloves are here. And that's Even right there, I thought you, you wore those padded gloves. This is, all, this is all the difference. This is all from lacrosse. Okay. And that's, I got whacked here, I remember 100% got whacked during the game when I was trying to end, like, kill the clock. Mm -hmm. when, when you had her and you're shaking, did she scratch you anywhere? No. No? No. She one of the things that you'll see in victims of domestic abuse when they have an attacker, they'll try to gouge, you know, and they'll look under their fingernails. And so the first thing that the medical examiners, investigators do when they show up on scene, they will uh, wrap the hands in paper. They tie them down here, tie them down here, and they preserve whatever's on their hands. So if there's gunshot residue or if there's uh, DNA of the attacker under their fingernails, that's one of the things that they look for. A little girl. She's tiny. Yeah, she did not know. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't try to me. hit you or anything like that? No. Okay. So you, you kick in the door. Yeah, and that's, the, that, that, that's how I got her. Yeah. Okay. And then I stuck my hand through and unlocked it and went in there. And In his saving grace, he does not describe murder one. And that means he wanted to go there to talk to her and had no intention of killing her. So to that extent, maybe you could finagle, you know, a murder three or, or uh, it's more than manslaughter. But maybe not an intentional murder two or felony murder. Okay. Everything else is for you. The detectives leave the room for roughly three minutes. When they return, it appears Ed is given the chance to lead with a few of his own questions. I, I know we, we touched about what uh, what happened last night, but set it up for me, lead it up to me a little bit here. Why did you guys break up exactly? Why? Why? Yeah. Well, we are not, we are not from the same area. Right. And I'm going, or she wants me to New York and I'm not exactly sure where, what I'm doing yet, but I'd like to move to San Francisco. Why'd you take her computer? I don't know. I have no idea. There's maybe maybe because there's evidence on the computer, emails that you sent. No, there's no. I mean, you you can find you can read all the emails and right. everything back and forth. Detective Ed now asks George if he held Yardley down on the bed. He's trying to subtly set the grounds for an argument of smothering, which isn't a terrible idea, but would be disproven by the autopsy regardless. No, no. Did you fall down on top of her? You know, wrestling we were around? wrestling on the ground for like a little bit. You don't wrestle on the bed at all? No, I never like, no. Never like, I mean, I shook her. No, I mean like, just kind of hold her down until she calmed down on the bed? No, if anything, that would, I mean, I mean, if, any, if anything, that would be like on the floor when we were on the floor when her nose started bleeding. Like rest. It, it isn't a smothering case. It, it, it is I beat the shit out of her and she died case. Around, and that's when her nose started bleeding. Was it pretty noisy when you all were wrestling around? No, I mean, she screaming. No, 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 she, no, she was no, no, she was not screaming actually. Which contradicts uh, her saying she is freaking out. How do you freak out without screaming? Okay, if, I'm cracking, if I'm cracking my head in the wall, I'm going to be saying, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, she was not screaming. Yeah. She should have been. 
Probably, I mean, maybe. Yeah, she should have been. Probably, I mean, maybe. She should have been. Well, why should she have been screaming? <laughs> what the fuck? Why should she have been screaming? Because you were torturing the fuck out of her? That could be a good reason for screaming. She should have been screaming. I mean, how do you not... I mean, you can't... As a defense lawyer, there's nothing I can do with that statement. As a prosecutor, I can do a whole fucking lot with that statement. Probably, I mean, maybe. Yeah, she should have been. Probably, I mean, maybe. Honestly. I don't know. Why do you think she should have been? I don't know. I mean, well, she was screaming when I first, like, came into the room. She was like, no, like, I'm not talking to you. Like, it's both out of your she was terrified. Guarantee you, this isn't the first time he put his hands on her. And that's probably why they broke up. All that. But, like. At any point, before you said you, you, and this was your words, you said you tossed her on the bed and then you left. Yeah. All right. At any point before that, did she lose consciousness? No. Okay. What happened after you tossed her on the bed? Did she move? Sometimes you can go to sleep with a bad head injury and just never wake up. Talk about, to say something. I mean, I literally toss her around and turn around and. Toss her on the ground or toss her on the bed? On the bed. And walk, walk out the door. Okay. So when you toss her back on the bed. So she's a young lady, little, especially compared to him because he's a decent sized guy, and he tosses her on the bed. What you've seen here described in his own words is just a horrific callous sense of entitlement by somebody who feels like he got fucked over and he's going to let her have it and then his last final parting gesture is him tossing her on the bed as if she's just not worth it in, in your mind she's she's oh. bleeding but you said she was bleeding out her nose, and, and you didn't you didn't feel like you needed to call rescue. No. After that, after banging her head and no, she, I, shaking I, her, I, and blood coming out her nose on the floor. No. See, there's no way to answer that in a, in a positive way. That's going to help him. This is why these these interviews almost never help the defendant. There's nothing about like. Yeah, but you missed anything that you want to ask him right now? There's nothing about like going going to get anything or going, you know, I don't know, I took a computer. George rambles about why there was no reason for taking the laptop for another 20 seconds, during which time Detective Reeves decides that enough information has been attained. Phase two is now complete and the fate of Yardley is about to be revealed. These moments in interrogations are considered important for the purpose of gauging a suspect's response. It's believed that a sharp and sudden revelation can make it difficult to fabricate emotion. So in theory, this will cause a suspect to provide either a genuine response or a relatively obvious disingenuous response, which often comes in the pretense of shock or remorse. I mean, I guess that's where my logic was at, but mm -hmm. that, which is... Well, I have to tell you I think I know why you took the computer. In the midst of what would have been a flawlessly executed moment, Detective Ed jumps back into the laptop mystery. The suspect has essentially confessed to murder. This and you don't need, who gives a shit about the laptop, honestly? It really wasn't the time for regurgitated conjecture over a petty theft misdemeanor, which Ed was clearly being advised of once again through nonverbal communication. Well, that is pretty funny to look at her expressions, like why the fuck are you bringing that up? What do you think? You, is that all right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. She's dead. You killed her, George. You killed her. She's dead? I think you knew that already. No, I did not. In our opinion, George is being truthful here, and we believe the interrogator feels the same way in this moment. And that is good from one standpoint, is that it can be classified as an unintentional homicide however certain states have domestic abuse homicide which can carry with it life without parole she's dead how the fuck is she dead because you killed her george how the fuck is she dead because you killed her
George appears to be going through a delayed response. It's so foreign a revelation that it's yet to sink in. Once the shock settles, he refuses to accept it, and this denial appears to be a momentary coping mechanism before the reality of the situation truly hits him, which will happen at this time in the footage. She's dead? Yes. She's dead? Yes. She's dead? She's dead. How? How? I already told you how. You already told us how as well. How is she dead? You just told us. Oh my god. You went in there to talk with her, but I got out of control, right, George? The detectives will now add further pressure to keep him no talking. Question. Suspects will often divulge information in these moments in the panicked attempt to save themselves, and in doing so can shut down a more credible storyline they haven't thought up yet. The alcohol got a hold of you. You kicked in her door. She started to fight with you. You punched her in the head or you cracked She's not dead. You cracked She's her head. Dead. You cracked She's her head dead. in the window or in the, in the wall. She's not dead. She is. She's not dead. I ain't BSing you right now. I'm serious. I want to see. I want to see her. George, George, she is dead. You are not here to dance with us. You're, you're here because she's dead. The alcohol. I did? don't believe it. I don't believe it's it. true, I, dude. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I did it. I, I don't believe that she's dead. How did you? How did, how I don't did, believe that she's dead. I she, don't believe that she's did, dead. Did you punch her? Did you hit her? How, she's, there's walk. no way she's dead. There's, she's not dead. I didn't. Listen, I listen, never listen. did anything. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I've made a case where a guy fell in the ice. Uh, caused by a push by my client and the guy didn't die for five days until five days later so these head injuries can have a delayed reaction i did not All right, let's let's calm down i did not like hurt her like she's she's not dead let's calm down. just for, out of protocol what we gotta do is stand up for me go ahead put your hands behind your back turn relax turn. relax you be around tell me she's not dead tell me she's not dead though please you tell me she's not dead. Relax. No, you're fucked Please. and she is dead. You know what? I wish I could tell you that, George. 22 year old. 22. And her life is done. She's not. I can't I do anything like that. Oh my God. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. I do not believe it. I do not believe it. There's no way. There's no way she could be dead. Either the head trauma or asphyxiation. It, it, there was no asphyxiation. Okay. But plenty oh, of head oh trauma. My god, oh my god! Oh my god! What, what was she doing the last time you saw her? And let me just tell you something. So you get fucked over. So you get your heart broken a little bit. Move the fuck on. You know, you don't take it out on somebody like that. You never, 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 never. Never, never, ever, ever motherfucking put your goddamn hands on a woman. You just don't fucking do it. Period. She was like, she was like standing up with me. She was standing up with me. She was standing up with me, looking at me. She was standing or holding you? She were was standing her. up, looking at me. Okay. But that doesn't mean she couldn't die from brain injuries later. She's not dead. I know she's not dead. I know. Oh, 100 million reasons she's not dead. I did. She cannot be dead. I know. 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 Didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, but I shook the fuck out of her and caused these injuries. A little bit persistent. What a dumb shit. Screaming? She should have been. I didn't kill her and leave. I didn't just. Oh my god. I didn't kill her. I did not kill her. I did not kill her. I did not. I did not. There's no way I can do it. No way. No way. <laughs> Well, sorry, George, you're in an interrogation room in handcuffs and about to go into a cold cell with a jumpsuit. And, and I hope you like bologna sandwiches because uh, you're going to be the fifth generation addicted to bologna sandwiches in custody. Oh. Cold war.
<laughs> now he wants a lawyer. Now he wants a fucking lawyer. Oh, Jesus Christ. Well, they got to stop all questioning now. Gee, I, now that I'm really fucked, I want a lawyer. <laughs> what a dumb shit. Just a, a, This is one of the dumbest guys I've ever seen. I want a lawyer. I don't they believe this. They should stop it immediately. Still, there's no way. There's no way. There's no fucking way. So, what, 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 should I talk to someone? Who do you want to talk to? A Anyone. lawyer. A lawyer. What do I get appointed to you? Okay, what do I do now? Go to jail? Yeah. All right, George, right now, I know you're, you, you, no, no one want to talk to us, that's fine, just let you know something. We're working on a search warrant right now, and what it is, is we're going to have to collect some stuff from you, like what's called a buckle swab, okay? Why did you guys say, why did you guys come in and say you were searching for an assault? Now it's back to I am the one who is the victim here. Why did you guys fuck me over with it, you know? I never said anything about an assault. Someone came in this morning. I never mentioned to you anything. Just told you we're investigating something. So investigating. You want to make call anybody for you, George? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to call you back. Okay. 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 At the start of this video, you were asked to think of what you would do in this situation. Really try and imagine what would be going through your mind in this moment, as you might just gain a restorative outlook from both knowing the answer while not having to answer this particular question. And this is where George just realized he fucked up. But there is of course no possible way you will gain anything close to the newfound perspective George has acquired in this moment, which unfortunately for him is no longer of use. Want me to call your dad? Is it, you call it mom? Your mom? Is that what you'd like me to call? Is that an old school? Mm hmm. Is it an old school? I don't know about that. What's your mom's name? Oh my god. What's her number? 30196. Okay. How? Did you want me to call your dad? Or just her? She will talk. Mm -hmm. She can tell her everything. Okay. How? <laughs> I don't believe it. How is she? There's no way she can be dead. There's no way. No. There's no way. There's no way. There's no. These next few moments are a turning point. The leg iron seemed to initiate a shift in his constitution, and his denial will completely cease from this point forward. He will continue to ask why and how, but he will no longer reject the severity of what is happening. from the beginning of this interview. So if you look at this, we're into this like an hour and 18 minutes, right? So it's only taken that long to get this full story from him. And I think he was probably largely being truthful. He, I don't think he realized from his own narcissism how he was inculpating himself, but a lot of these more conniving and like Jody Arias, for example, those interviews take place over days, you know, hours. And um, we don't have that here. They, this is actually a pretty succinct interview. Huh. Heck of a day, bud. That was how worries. I am here the rest of my life. I'm sorry? So I am here the rest of my life in this room? No, jail. Oh, man. Oh, bad guy, man. Never said you were, bud. <laughs> yeah, you are. Call my mom. I'm sorry? Call my mom. Not right now. Yeah, you do want to talk to her. 
that was when you need your family the most. But. And here's the other thing. You call your mom, that's going to be recorded too. <laughs> I personally don't understand putting your hands on a woman like that. I just... It is just so wrong, you know? And I know I'm going to get some heat from guys saying, what if she did this? What if she went at you with a baseball bat? You know, fuck that. You know, you just don't put your hands on a woman. Period. Period. End of story. I didn't even hurt her. God, you killed that poor girl. George was taken to the regional jail soon after this moment. He would go on to plead not guilty to murder and was held without bond for almost two years awaiting trial. It began on February 6, 2012. Well, testimony is now underway in the murder trial of the former UVA lacrosse player accused of killing his ex-girlfriend. So you, t you get taken into custody, and generally speaking, when it's a, a situation like this, you have a bond hearing. And bond on something like this, in my last case, that I had a bond hearing on something like this, they asked for $2 million. I got it reduced down to 500000 But when you have a situation like this, some states have it where you can be held without bond. First time we have video of Hughley as he was led into the courtroom, contrary to his appearance in the days that followed his arrest for the murder of 22-year-old Yardley Love, he appeared pale, frail, and gaunt. The prosecution presented a case that Hughley went to Love's apartment that night, busted through her bedroom door, and in some way struck her, causing blunt force trauma, which led to her death. We've also learned that on that night, George Hughley was exchanging what were described as playful text messages with three other women. Those. Why the fuck, honestly, it, why, why do that? You can get laid someplace else. But you felt so disrespected. You felt so wronged. Come on, man. Messages continued late into the night and even after the alleged attack. Throughout this trial, Hughley has sat expressionless, almost stoic at the defense table. All of that changed today. As this police interview was airing, Hughley began crying, was often pinching the bridge of his nose with his... You know what that means? That means, oh, I am so fucked. That's what that means hands and looking down as he listened to the sound of his own hysterical voice. I did not kill her. I did not kill her. I did not. I did not. In court Tuesday, Hughley's defense faced an uphill climb. The most riveting testimony came from former UNC lacrosse player Michael Burns, who testified that one time while visiting UVA, he heard some yelling for help from Hughley's apartment. When he opened the door, he said he found Hughley with his arm wrapped around Love's neck, choking her. Hugh really? Well, that's a lovely image. Good thing somebody else was there on that particular occasion. Didn't I tell you I said uh, that this wouldn't have been the first time that he, that he put his hands on her? Then let her go, and she ran out of the room crying. A variety of medical experts took the stand this Wednesday, and they all seemed to agree that Love's death was the result of blunt force trauma to the head. This was followed by highly distressing witness testimony from Yardley's neighbors. The noise was so loud, this was such a violent death that they heard it downstairs, two separate witnesses, and it... There's a lovely person. Like a stereo crashing to the ground. And it certainly didn't help that the jury knew that she was alive for two hours before she died, indicating that if George Hughley had come to his senses, he could have gone back there, called 911, and possibly saved her life. Still, the driving argument for the defense is that George Hughley never intended to kill. They say this was all a tragic accident, that he does not deserve a life sentence, but instead a lesser charge and a second chance. That's the only thing that they could do with that and with his confession. That's the only thing you can do is say it was and just go on the one element of intent. Guilty of second degree murder and you will hear the sentence momentarily. A 26 year prison term came down. George Hughley was brought to court to hear his lawyers plead for the judge to cut in half the 26 year sentence recommended by the jury. Judge Edward Hogshire did trim it back but by just three years. The jury in this case recommended 26 years. The judge changed it to 23, probably a small difference, but, but why would he do that? It's surprising, isn't it, considering this is a woman who was beaten to death in her own bed. We think that George was convicted of a crime inconsistent with the facts, and he received a penalty inconsistent with what the evidence would require. There are no winners 
uh, in this case. With credit for the time that George Hughley has already served in jail, and if he gets time off for good behavior, he could be out in 18 years. And the family for Yardley Love has put out this statement, saying, we find no joy in other sorrow. We are relieved to put this chapter behind us. As for George, he was incarcerated at the Maximum Security Augusta Correctional Center for 10 years and has since been transferred to a prison work camp in Richmond where he's expected to serve out the rest of his sentence. The present consensus in the media is that George had no intention of killing Yardley, but that his 23-year sentence is still appropriate, if not lenient, and that him being drunk to any degree at the time of the murder is not an excuse, nor does it lessen the culpability of his actions to any extent. He'll be released at the age of 45, meaning he will have the second chance at life Yardley was never afforded. You can decide for yourself whether he deserves it or not. That was our reaction to the to Yardley's murder and uh, George Hughley V. And it's just so preventable, so preventable. When we talk about domestic abuse, it's not a funny joke, even though I joked around a little bit during this. It was just at his fucking stupidity. It all can be avoided. You know, I put out messages for all you guys to build, build your relationships, build your education, build your financial future, build on the things that are good in you and get rid of the things that are bad in you. And if you're one of these guys who can't take no for an answer, figure out your shit. Otherwise, you're going to wind up like George. Just makes no sense to have a situation where you can't control yourself, so you got to put your hands on somebody. Never a good idea ever it doesn't ever work i love you so much you'll love me even more if i beat the fuck out of you i mean come on i i don't know he, he was found guilty of second degree murder in minnesota second degree murder is 306 that's 25 and a half years so that's consistent with what we have here if it was an intentional homicide so he does get another shot at life she doesn't i don't think it was an intentional homicide but it's not mitigated by his alcohol intake like it's like they said here and it's not, and it's exacerbated by the fact that she's in her own bed with the door locked, and trying to get him to leave. It's a domestic abuse, a homicide. So to me, that elevates it a little bit. But his lawyers did a good job. Um, he's out, you know, in what? In about six years, he'll be out. So. This is Bruce Rivers, Criminal Lawyer Reacts. We'll see you next time. Make sure you subscribe, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, uh, sign up for Patreon. We're doing some good work there, and we'll see you next time here on Criminal Lawyer Reacts. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self snitching gon' get you put away. Bruce Rivers just broke down your case. He know all the charges that you about to face. You ain't coming home till 2058. That self-stitching gon' get you put away. 23-hour lockdown, please, is that my goal?